It's great to see so many here. I believe just under 200 have registered. And the audience very much reflects the nature of the Institute's work, which is a selection of trade unionists, academics and lawyers, uh, many of whom are in the audience tonight, I notice. So welcome to you all. I am, um, I'm really looking forward to hearing from each of our speakers this evening. I'm sorry to say that Keith Ewing can't join us tonight, but given that we only have an hour, that gives us longer to hear from and talk to our other two speakers, and that's good. Tonight, our theme looks to the future and asks what is to be done in terms of post-pandemic labour law policy proposals, and that's not easy to say, nor do, I'm sure. That discussion, of course, takes place against the background of a pandemic and a universal shift in attitudes on three significant issues. First, the role of workers, the role that workers play in maintaining the health, the wealth and the well-being of the nation. There is a strong sense now that we need to re-examine the status, the recognition and the pay of workers too often referred to as low skilled. Second, the role of trade unions in our society. Unions and the TUC have certainly shown their purpose and their worth during this crisis, not least the role this week of the NEU, and we all know the abuse that they took at the weekend. And that role of trade unions and trade unionists needs to be reflected in any framework of law in the future. And third, the utter failure of our labour law and enforcement mechanisms, not least the health and safety executive, to protect workers during this pandemic crisis. These are all issues that any new framework of labour law uh, must address. And to discuss those issues and more tonight, we are joined by two brilliant speakers, I'm sure you'll agree. So we have John Hendy, QC. John was instrumental in establishing the Institute of Employment Rights over 30 years ago. He has been our chair ever since. Last year, and I didn't ask John if I could say this, but last year John was appointed to the House of Lords by Jeremy Corbyn. And I've no doubt he will use that position to hold this government to account and to push for a fairer and more progressive framework of labour law fit for the 21st century. But our first speaker tonight is Andy MacDonald, who is fresh from the debacle of the new parliamentary voting system, I believe. Andy has been an MP for Middlesbrough since 2012. Until recently, Andy was Shadow Secretary of State for Transport, where he was a great advocate for an integrated transport system and a consistent voice for rail unions, both inside and outside Parliament. Andy is now Shadow Secretary of State for Employment Rights and Protections, a position created, I believe, by Jeremy Corbyn, originally held by Laura Pidcock and then Rachel Maskell. Andy is no newcomer to the law. He was a lawyer, I believe, in Thompson Solicitors, a firm that represents trade unions and workers. And I know that Andy and his team have been working closely with John Hendy and with Professor Keith Ewan discussing IER's policy ideas put forward in our 2016 Manifesto for Labour Law and developed in our Rolling Out the Labour Law publication only last year. So, Andy, the theme for tonight is what is to be done. One of the more common phrases heard through this pandemic is that there can be no going back to business as oh. usual. Oh. So give us your take, Andy, on what we should be aiming for in terms of policy proposals for a post-pandemic society, Andy. Okay. Thanks, thanks, Caroline. Is that uh, coming across loud and clear? That's lovely. Good. Oh, thanks for inviting me. I'm really grateful that you've asked me to speak in this. Uh, it's a very timely webinar on post-pandemic policy proposals. There you, there you go. I can do the alliteration. Um, and you're right. Until recent months, I was more used to participating in discussions around re-regulation of buses and decarbonisation of transport, cycling and walking and bringing our railway back together in public ownership. But in the latter stages of my role as Shadow Transport Secretary, the rights and protections of transport workers 
was the dominant issue in the wake of the pandemic. And as you rightly say, as a, a former uh, Thompson solicitor uh, coming to this brief, it's a bit of a homecoming for me. And I want to express my thanks to the IER for the support I've already been given. It's been quite magnificent uh, and incredibly informative. And I'm sure that association is going to continue. But the, but the struggle for employment rights and protections has been at the very heart and soul of the Labour and Trade Union movement from the time of its formation. And those victories we've achieved through the years, like the minimum wage and the five-day working week, haven't been handed down on a silver platter. Rather, they've come about because of the collective demands of working people to a great degree channeled through the Labour Party and the trade unions that helped to form it. And there have been many setbacks over the course of the past century, the most damaging of which came following Margaret Thatcher's victory in 79, and then again over the past 10 years of, of Tory rule. The extent to which protections, having been systematically weakened or rolled back altogether, has become palpable in recent months with the outbreak of coronavirus. We've seen the dreadful way in which so many undervalued workers who don't have the luxury of being able to work from home have felt forced to take the ultimate risk of putting their lives on the line or endangering the lives of their loved ones simply by going out to work to make ends meet. So that's why I'm incredibly honoured to have been given the responsibility as the Labour Party's Shadow Secretary of State for Employment Rights and Protections to speak up for workers at a time when a revaluation of work and the workplace rights could hardly be more pertinent. So as Keir Starmer has pledged, the Labour Party will work shoulder to shoulder with trade unions to stand up for working people, tackle insecure work and low pay, repeal the Trade Union Act, oppose Tory attacks on the right to take industrial action and the weakening of workplace rights. And I'm delighted that he sustained the commitment that Jeremy made that the next Labour government will re-establish a department for employment, thereby giving the 30 million working people across the country a dedicated voice at the cabinet table. And of course, this wouldn't be the first occasion that such a voice would be present at the top of government. In fact, the Department of Employment, or the Ministry of Labour as it was called initially, was first established as a department of the UK government at the height of the First World War. It played a vital role in planning the demobilisation and re-employment of those who survived the horrors of the trenches. It also had a key role in overseeing the employment matters of the Board of Trade, which had played a central role, role in bringing about uh, selective, uh, sectoral collective bargaining across many areas of the workforce in the years preceding World War I. Sectoral collective bargaining showed itself then and throughout the 20th century to be essential to any gains made by workers over wages and their extensions of rights and protections. For instance, the Coal Mines Regulations Act 1908 that limited the hours a miner could, could work to eight hours per day, an achievement that wouldn't have been possible without the collective bargaining of mine workers. And the department went through a number of uh, reformulations through the 20th century. Then in 1980, the Thatcher government dropped collective bargaining as a government policy, and the department gave a means by which uh, the government could choose to undermine rather than protect workers' rights. For example, the 1986 Sex Discrimination Act removed many protections on women's employment in an effort to drive down wages and extend working hours. And the ministry, of course, was finally disassembled by John Major in 95, with its responsibilities being split between various other departments. And some significant strides were made under the last Labour government, such as the introduction of the national minimum wage, although we didn't choose at that point to re-establish the department. But over the past decade, uh, Conservative-led governments have been able to inflict further damage on the rights and protections of working people, principally through the Trade Union Act of 2016. So today, as we go through the greatest health crisis in a century, and what is set to be the 
deepest economic crisis in three centuries, the re-establishment of a Department for Employment could not be more appropriate to oversee the safe return to work and the creation of a, an economy that works for the many by supporting green industry and a clean recovery. The laissez-faire approach taken by the Conservatives with regards to the protection of workers during, but also the years leading up to the coronavirus, uh, has shown itself to be fundamentally flawed. The government has been too slow to act at each step of its handling of the crisis, both with its failures to protect workplace health and safety, and more broadly, its failures to protect the lives and livelihoods of the population at large. The messaging on returning to work outside the home has created confusion with announcements from the PM and others, giving employers and employees precious little time to prepare. The sequence in which the government has set about ending the lockdown has put the cart before the horse. Clear guidance should have been published in advance of encouraging a return to work outside the home, not vice versa. And unfortunately, however, when the guidelines were published in mid-May, it became apparent that they were not sufficient for keeping workplaces safe, failing even to clarify existing legislation that regulates and restricts the risks to which workers are exposed. This includes requirements around the use of PPE, cleaning and washing, risk assessments, and protections for workers raising concerns of the health and safety. Furthermore, the Tories' austerity cuts to the health and safety executive, the body responsible for policing and enforcing the work workplace safety, has left it with half the budget and two thirds of the inspectors uh, enjoyed under the last Labour government. And we hear about the £14 million of emergency funds, but that's only going to go a very short way to make up the more than £100 million of funding that's been slashed from the HSE over the past decades, decade, and it still lacks the resources to fulfil its statutory role. And having been so stripped back by years of austerity, few prosecutions are ever brought, leaving workers at risk in unsafe conditions. In 2018-19, only 361 convictions were secured. That's a drop of 46% compared with 2015-16. And the HSE wasn't adequately resourced before the pandemic, and it's certainly not adequately resourced to meet the challenge of enforcing workplace health and safety on a widespread return to work outside the home. Safety in shops, offices and warehouses is, of course, the responsibility of local authorities, but the cuts to their finances has meant there's now only 543 full-time equivalent local authority inspectors responsible for 1.7 million premises. And no wonder the average workplace in Britain can, ex can expect an inspection only once in 260 years. It's madness. But the statistics released by the ONS detailing coronavirus-related deaths by occupation paint a, paint a really grim picture of how those in low paid work are far more likely to contract the virus and die as a result. The failures to protect such workers will need to be a core focus of any future public inquiry into the government's handling of the crisis, as will the fact that a disproportionate number of BAME people have contracted the virus and died due to the economic, social and health inequalities that are underpinned by structural racism which itself must be dismantled if we're to create an equal society that truly cares for all. And as the Member of Parliament representing my hometown of Middlesbrough, it's no surprise to me that as one of the poorest parts of the country, with 40% of children growing up below the poverty line, and where four out of five workers have to leave the home to go to their work, we're one of the worst areas hit by the crisis. Indeed, the long-standing, gaping uh, economic, social and health inequalities have only been exacerbated by the crisis, but it's clear that a new divide has become manifest in recent months. On the one hand, there are those who have the luxury of working from the safety and comfort of their own home, and on the other, there are those who are, who are for the most part, in low-paid employment, disproportionately blamed, 
and are required to leave home to travel to their workplace, risking their lives and the lives of their loved ones in the process. And we're not alone in thinking this because a recent poll showed that 40% of the British public worried about returning to work. And in 21st century Britain, going to work should not be a matter of life and death. But looking to the future, uh, and as Keir Starmer has said, and as you commented, Carolyn, at the outset, there can be no return to business as usual as we get through this crisis. Working people's lives and livelihoods must be given all the protections that a developed democratic society has to offer. No longer can the Conservative Party be allowed to treat working people with contempt, having one rule for them and another for the rest of us, and a mantra which has been effectively communicated in recent weeks with the scandal surrounding Dominic Cummings's breach of the very lockdown rules that he helped to write. So we want to see a new deal for working people, one that speaks to their economic and social rights, that reinstitutes sectoral collective bargaining to bring about secure employment with fair wages for all workers from day one of their employment, regardless of their gender or ethnicity. And it helps to build an economy that can address the existential challenges posed by climate change. What the history of the labor and trade union movement has taught us is that only through collective struggle will we defeat injustices within and without the workplace. And what the coronavirus has taught us is that governments can take steps to intervene in the economy in ways that for more than half of the past 40 years at least have seemed impossible. So in my view, Karen, it's our duty as and when we come out of this crisis to have a better deal for working people and a fundamental departure from the exploitation of workers and grossly unequal practices that have obtained in our recent history, leaving worker, working people exposed, unprotected, and insufficiently rewarded. We simply have to make the change and secure a better settlement and a better future. Thanks very much for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Andy. Uh, that was a great history of a Ministry of Labour and um, uh, uh, and what it can achieve in terms of spread sectoral collective and produce fairer uh, results for workplaces. I think we might be having some difficulty, some technical difficulty with sound. Uh, I hope everybody can hear us. If you can't, it is being recorded and it will be on the website tomorrow. So stay with us if you can. Um, I think that James has muted everybody and turned your videos off, which helps, I think. Um, so thanks very much for that, Andy. Uh, you mentioned the HSE and um, Boris Johnson's promise of spot checks spot everywhere. Checks. Um, <laughs> joke, as you said, and the £14 million that they made such a big fuss about given. Um, but it was only announced yesterday by Prospect that that £14 million would be spent on call centres and these spot checks would be done on phone. I can just imagine employers um, shaking in their boots at the idea of getting a phone call from the HSE and not think much behind it. So yes, it is another example of the kind of spin and fake news that the government too often uh, puts out. At this point, I said I would go to the chat room and look at some questions that may be put to you. Um, we had one question in from uh, Roger Jerry. You mentioned, Andy, the idea of uh, wanting a new deal for the future. And Roger's question is, given the likelihood that Labour will not be in power for a few years, um, which of the many changes needed to employment law will you be able to persuade the government to implement before you take office? Well, don't hold my breath that we can persuade them of anything, but we can certainly show the way. Um, and I think one of the major things that struck me since taking up the, the brief is this whole approach to the definition of an employee or, or, or more broadly a worker and the infinite variety of a, a contractual arrangements that leave people so terribly exposed. And surely the Tories can see 
that this is a fundamental weakness if we're going to have people feeling confident uh, as they go about their, 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 their daily work, they must have those protections and they must be afforded across the board comprehensively to everybody who goes to work, uh, regardless of whether they're a LIMB worker, uh, a zero hours contract, uh, uh, quasi self-employed, bogus self-employed, however you want to describe it, those protections are not there. And this coronavirus has just laid that bare. So I'd like to think that there was um, an appetite for a look at that. I think it's one of the most important things, but there are so many um, uh, uh, in terms of how we treat um, people on described as low skilled, low paid. Um, we have to have a complete recalibration uh, and reconstitution of the deal between society and the people who provide uh, 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 vital services. So there's a hell of a lot to do. Picking one is, uh, an imp is really difficult. But I think it's that issue around the variety of employment contracts that's probably uh, opportune, if I can put it that way. And sectoral collective bargaining will itself improve uh, the nature of the economy. Is that, does that fit with your thoughts? The sectoral uh, uh, bargaining, in all the discussions that I've had since uh, April, it's that the forefront of people's thinking who've been involved in this uh, for, for, for decades. Uh, and, and we saw from that brief glance back over the last 100 years or more, how that was at the core of not only raising people's uh, incomes and living standards, but about the whole uh, principle of creating demand in the economy. Uh, and to move away from it has been such a self-inflicted wound on our country and our society and our economy. And we've got to get back to that. There are opportunities. People, and I saw, I saw one of the brief comments in the chat room that, low pay doesn't equate to low skill. How, how right is that? But, but the, the whole approach to the care sector is now people are aghast at the, the terrible wages that people who are at the front line of, of providing the most important service to another human being and we don't value the work they do in terms of the reward that they receive. So um, I think uh, wiser counsel uh, than I, uh, cautions against picking out particular um, uh, sections of the, the workforce and would prefer to extol the virtues of the broad principles of collective bargaining. But it is a real example uh, of, of the injustice that's been allowed to obtain for such uh, a terribly long time, but also that there is an appetite in wider society to do the right thing by people that we do value very, very highly. So um, if that perhaps answers it, Carolyn, I hope so, yeah. Yeah, um, I said that was the last one, but I, I, I will ask you just a, a one more. Um, and it refers back to your role as Transport um, Shadow, Trans Shadow Transport Secretary of State for Transport. <laughs> Um, and, and what you learned from there. Yesterday, we heard that the government intends to introduce a workforce of unpaid and unskilled workers onto the railway. And what's more, they didn't even mention, let alone negotiate that position with the transport uh, workers. How can we hold the government to account and what can we do to prevent those kinds of developments? Well, I would be absolutely horrified if the Rail Safety Standards Board and the Office for Rail and Road sanctioned such a reckless move. Uh, and let's just say this, I, don't, I wouldn't expect our railway unions to accept that lying down. I think there would be significant problems that would be so foolhardy to start to introduce people without training, without knowledge of the, the industry, without their uh, uh, understanding of the needs of, uh, of passengers, 
or of the workings of the railway to be put into an environment such as that without, at the very least, very detailed discussions and consultations with the rail unions, that would be sheer folly. It's about as ludicrous as the minimum uh, service levels that they would like to uh, uh, pursue within the rail industry. They will be equally ill-fated if they try to proceed with it. They should step back from that. That would not be a good move. Thanks very much for that, Andy. I'm going to move on at this point to our next speaker, who is John, John Hendy. I've been working with John now for over 30 years. Uh, he never fails to surprise me and his knowledge of law, his empathy with workers and his understanding of the role trade unions play in society. Um, with Keith Ewing, uh, John has led the team of 26 labour law experts who developed our uh, manifesto for labour law ideas. So, John, we've just heard Andy's ideas on the future policy proposals. What would you like to add to that contribution? Thank you, Cad, and thank you, Andy, for a wonderful presentation. I, I'd like to pick up two uh, general themes, uh, one of which I'll deal with in a little bit more detail. And the two themes are the one that Cad, uh, Carolyn uh, opened with, namely the failure of, of uh, labour law leading up to the uh, co coronavirus crisis. And it, uh, this is so dramatic. I think everybody in the country understands uh, now that our labour laws, that's to say the laws of the workplace, have completely failed uh, to protect workers or to empower them to deal with the situation in which they're in. And you can pick uh, many aspects of, of this, but ju let's just mention four of them. One is the failure to protect uh, workers' income. I mean, th we, we have a national minimum wage in this country, and yet uh, we're told by the HMRC that uh, in 2019, 424,000 jobs were paid below the national minimum wage rate. Uh, in 2018, 20% of workers over the age of 25 were paid less than the uh, minimum wage, and that had increased to 25% of uh, workers over the age of 25 paid less in 2019. So th this is a terrible problem. And we know, of course, from lots of statistics from the UN Rapporteur on poverty, from uh, Sir Michael Marmot's report uh, earlier this year, that something like 9 million people living in poverty are living in households where people worked. Uh, so it gives you some idea of the scale of the lack of protection for income. And now with COVID-19, we've seen millions of workers who fall outside the protections of the, the, or the income protection scheme, even the miserable sick pay, uh, statutory sick pay, yeah. uh, uh, and so on. And then se secondly, in relation to jobs themselves, job security. We know that a quarter of the workforce are worried about the security of their jobs, uh, which has grown to uh, uh, an even higher percentage now faced with the, uh, as Andy said, the, the most massive re recession, according to the Bank of England, since 1709. 3.6 uh, million people are expected to be un unemployed by the end of, uh, of this year. Uh, labor law has not protected their jobs. It's not even a got, there's no provision there apart from consultation over collective redundancies. There's no requirement to consult workers over the termination of, of their uh, employment where a firm goes bust or into uh, liquidation. And the third area which is particularly striking is health and safety at work, of course, which Andy has uh, already remarked upon. Here we've got workers being sent with obvious risks, or risks to, that are evident to lay people, let alone doctors and epidemiologists, sent to work, exposed to the risk of infection, but without adequate PPE. 
uh, we have laws about PPE. We have laws which require work, um, employers to make and keep workplaces safe. And yet these have completely failed to give workers the protections that, that are required. Now the government is trying to force people back to work in conditions where they cannot guarantee the safety of the workforce. And the fourth area, which uh, I, I find the most troubling is one or perhaps I've already touched on. It, it's the lack of uh, any voice being given to workers, any chance of industrial democracy, any say that the workers have in the conditions in which they uh, uh, work. Take, for example, the coronavirus job retain, a job, um, uh, in, sorry, the coronavirus income protection uh, scheme where uh, employers can decide to furlough workers. No provision there that the workers ought to be consulted as to whether they want to be furloughed or not. No provision if the employer decides not to furlough the workers yeah. uh, that the, those workers have any uh, say there. And we, what we've seen in, in the, over the last 40 years is an almost complete collapse in the coverage of collective bargaining. In 1979, 82% of workers had the benefit of a collective agreement. That percentage now is uh, less than 26%. My, my reckoning is it's about 23% of workers. And in the private sector, it's uh, only just into double uh, digits. Uh, all, all that means is that workers don't have a say over the terms and conditions on which they uh, work. They all or leave it basis. So the, those are the, the failures of, of uh, uh, some of the failures of a uh, labor law that have been revealed by the COVID-19 uh, crisis. When we look to the longer term, which is the other aspect I wanna deal with, the question is what, what should we be looking for? And one of um, your questions, Cad, has already uh, remark that we're not going to get a lot of change out of the Conservative government. Well, we're not going to get a lot of change out of the Conservative government if we don't press them. If we press them, we might get something. And what we, what we have to do in the longer term is to get a government uh, elected, which will implement the changes that are necessary. And um, what we've been doing in the Institute of Employment uh, Rights Carolyn, Keith Ewing, and many other colleagues, some of whom are in the audience uh, this evening, is trying to identify all the changes that are required to ensure decent work, a decent standard of living, uh, and a decent, decent lifestyle for uh, people. Now, what we've done in the booklets that uh, Carolyn held up at the beginning is to put forward proposals on virtually every aspect of the law at work, dealing with zero hours contracts, hours of work uh, generally, the reduction of the working week to take account of um, artificial in, uh, intelligence and uh, so on, changes to redundancy law, to unfair dismissal, to equality uh, law, changes to the requirements for supply chains to make sure that cheap labor overseas is not exploited to, the, to their detriment and to the detriment of workers in this country. But I, I just wanna focus on three of these areas. Two of them I'll deal with very briefly indeed because Andy's already uh, uh, covered them. Uh, those, those are single status for workers. Let's get rid of the distinction between employees, full self-employed, what the lawyers call the limby uh, workers and other variants. Let's have a single status of worker with all employment rights available to those workers from day one of their uh, engagement. That would deal with a lot of problems that have been thrown up in the uh, coronavirus crisis. All the um, uh, Uber and Eat and other delivery riders and many, many other gig economy workers uh, who lost their jobs, uh, um, casual workers lost their 
uh, jobs and can't claim any benefit at all of any kind whatsoever because they're, they're, they're no longer in work. Um, the, the second area, which Andy has already covered, is enforcement. We've got major pro proposals in relation to enforcement, a single worker protection agency properly funded to deal with not just health and safety at work, but all other aspects, minimum wage, enforcement of collective agreements and so on, and ramping up employment at tribunals, bringing back the wing members, that's to say the lay representatives from the employer side and the workers side, so that it's a proper tripartite tri tribunal uh, uh, and uh, proper uh, measures of compensation, some of which will, will for which directors will be personally uh, liable. So a whole regime, new regime for enforcement. But that leaves me with the, the what I regard, and Andy has already said, is the single most in, important uh, change to our industrial relations. And that is the reinstatement of sectoral uh, collective uh, bargaining. And what I'd like to do for the last couple of minutes, Cad, is just touch on the reasons why sectoral collective bargaining, that's to say collective bargaining between unions representing workers in a particular sector of industry and their, the uh, employers associations representing employers in that se sector, why that is so important. And there, there are basically four particular re reasons. One is that it's an economic necessity. Collective bargaining has been demonstrated by a myriad of economists to raise wages. Workers covered by collective uh, agreements earn more than workers who are not. In America, they call that the union premium. And it's a significant percentage uh, of difference in earnings. It raises wages and the effect of raising wages on a national basis, sector by sector, is that that creates demand in the economy. That creates jobs, of course. And that is the reason why sectoral collective bargaining was turned to in the 1930s to get the world out of the uh, Great Recession that followed the, the crash in 1929. Not just in Britain, but in France, in the Scandinavia, in the United States of America too. Sectoral collective bargaining was found to be uh, the answer. Not only does it raise wages, but that has the effect of raising the tax take of the government, which gives the government more revenue to spend on services. It reduces the amount of benefit that's paid by government to subsidize low uh, wages. And it also has the effect, which is very attractive to good employers, of preventing undercutting. Because if you set the costs of labor across an entire sector, it means that the cowboys can't, by uh, paying low wages, undercut uh, the big boys. That's one reason for sectoral collective bargaining. The second is that the economists have shown to us that co extensive collective bargaining, particularly sectoral collective bargaining, uh, reduces inequality. And inequality is one of the blights of this country, as we've seen in the COVID-19 crisis. Who have been the people who have had the highest incidence of coronavirus and died the most? They are the lower income, um, the, the lower earners in the workforce, the most exposed and the most uh, susceptible. This is completely intolerable. And Sir Michael Marmot's uh, report uh, earlier this year demonstrated that inequality creates bad health and a lower life expectancy. And that is not, not simply true of the lowest of the earners, it's true across the entire spectrum of earning. The lower you, you the, the less you earn, the more likely you are to have bad health and lower life expectancy. And I want to just emphasize that point about lower life expectancy. 
by having the degree of inequality in earnings in this country, we are condemning our fellow citizens to die before they ought to. That, that is just completely intol intolerable. And sectoral collective bar bargaining is not the only answer, but it's a, it's a very good answer, a very good uh, remedy um, uh, for uh, that. And uh, if we can er diminish inequality, even if we can't eradicate it, if we can diminish it, we may be able to eliminate poverty, which is another blight in this country. 14 million people living it below the poverty uh, line. And the penultimate reason is, of course, industrial democracy. Sectoral collective bargaining is a way in which workers can be heard about the terms and conditions on which they work. It's hard to think of any other effective way in which wor workers can have that input. I'm, of course, in favor of putting workers on boards of directors. That's a very good uh, thing. But ultimately, collective bargaining with a responsive uh, a constituency telling the unions what they want and what is acceptable to them is the best and most efficient way in which workers can have their voices heard uh, at work. And finally, the reason that, of course, appeals to uh, Keith Ewing and I and the, some of the other lawyers in the audience this evening is that collective bargaining is a duty on this country under various international treaties to which it's a uh, signatory. So when we're advancing the case as we must to this government, even if they show us a tin ear, uh, we, we've got to know what it is we're asking for. We have to explain also to the workforce and to the electorate just what it is that the Labour Party stands for and how it will transform the workplace of the future. We have those technical solutions. We ha have now to get the message out there. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, John. Uh, brilliant as ever. You've gone through the four major failures and the four major demands that we want to put forward for the future. It's raised, obviously, a number of questions in the chat box. Uh, one of the issues, of course, the, one of the other issues sectoral collective bargaining would bring about was, would be improved equality in terms of race and sex and disability and, 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 and many in the chat room have raised some of those issues. And of course, domestically and internationally, those issues of equality have been brought up just recently. Last, year, last week was the 50th anniversary of the Equal Pay Act and highlighted that it would take about another 50 years for the UK to fulfill um, uh, um, the, uh, the equal pay in this country. And then, of course, we've seen in America that uh, George Floyd can be killed on the streets by a person who is supposed to be in charge of looking after citizens. So introducing more equality and listening to what workers and what people and what families need is clearly a way to try and change the nature and the narrative in society. So yes, uh, very good. Uh, let's see, some questions from the chat rooms. How do we, is it how, how could we embed employment charters within public procurement processes to require and sectoral collective bargaining? So is that something that we can do? Shall I, shall I do, deal what, what? With, with that? Sorry, go on, Andy. No, sorry. no, just, just, I just think now is a, a really important moment where there's going to be a lot of companies wanting the assistance of government to survive. The issue of conditionality about the terms upon which that assistance is provided is optimal right now. It should always have been the case um, uh, in every major uh, item of infrastructure procurement, for example, um, w why we wouldn't actually put those uh, terms in. Uh, John McDonnell uh, 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 went to some considerable lengths to set that out in terms of how we uh, invest in our economy, invest in our infrastructure, making sure that those uh, companies that do uh, have uh, trade union uh, recognition uh, and uh, we, can, we can really embed all of those principles in how we uh, procure services, procure infrastructure, 
but those companies that are requiring assistance, this is the opportunity to do it. Whether that will be grasped is another matter altogether. We, I've never heard a Conservative government talk so much about trade unions and the need to engage with them. My real fear is that as we emerge from this crisis, there will be the revert to type and the uh, overwhelming desire to put trade unionism back in its box. Uh, but most certainly, this is an opportunity to embed those demands uh, in uh, uh, charters and the like. Uh, but sorry, John, I, I, I cut across you, but I just wanted no, to say that not, about conditionality. Not, not at all. I, I, I absolutely um, agree. Uh, the Labour Party, when it comes to power, could, could of course extend public procurement and not merely make it a condition of, of public contracts, but a condition of every financial assistance given to uh, companies in the form of, um, as you've mentioned, in, in loans and grants uh, and so forth. It could be attached a requirement of a good behaviour, recognition of unions, uh, adherence to collective agreements could be attached to all the licenses uh, that are required by uh, corporations uh, uh, as well. So uh, I, it, it's a very powerful weapon. And of course, it, it's been a, a, a weapon historically from 1894 onwards with the Fair Wages Resolution of the House of Commons of 1894, which required all public contracts to pay the going rate, which of course meant the collectively bargained rate. So nothing new about that. Um, nothing radical uh, about it, but an essential tool in the in the armory. So far as co sectoral collective bargaining itself is concerned, it doesn't really require that additional uh, uh, tool because we would uh, introduce sectoral collective bargaining by legislation, rather like the Wages Councils Act. And the technique would be to make whatever the agreement was struck between the unions and the employers for the sector automatically and legally binding on every employer and every worker within the, that uh, sector. Thanks, John. And of course, procurement and investment could be used uh, to answer a, another question asked in our chat box from Sam Mason who says we're facing major economic restructuring and COVID has accelerated this um, and we could use it for automation and developing or encouraging the growth of the green economy. So is it time for a just transition law? Yes. <laughs> and, 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 and I know Ed Miliband is doing work on this very issue right now with a number of uh, colleagues. So. Sam is right on the on the money, literally. Um, the the focus has to be on the emerging industrial base coming out of this, which has got to be predicated uh, on a decarbonised uh, net zero uh, platform. So, absolutely right. That's exactly what we should be concentrating on. And I hope to see some further um, detail around that very very soon indeed. Great, thanks. Um, last week it was reported that trade union membership had grown for the third year running with nearly an extra 100,000 members taken on and, that, and since COVID that uh, growth in trade union has just grown and grown with thousands more unions being recruited, mainly led by women, um, which is unsurprising. How can we, Pete Middleman from the National Education Union asks, how can we translate the, the leap forward in workplace organisation from the pandemic into wider communities, uh, particularly those communities that have been left behind? Well, I think from, a, from my perspective, that puts the burden upon uh, us in the, in the Labour Party to be having those conversations in communities. Uh, and uh, certainly Kia has uh, set his stall out uh, in that, that that conversation, that listening has to uh, start right now. And he's already begun the process and we are being um, uh, 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 requested to, 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 to join him in that journey. So I think that's part of how we 
embed that growth in trade unionism and make sure that that relationship is developed. All I would say is, is a word of caution, of course, because we're going to have so many people who are going to be losing their jobs. So whilst we're going to have a, a growth, I think, did somebody say there was 20,000 on the uh, NEU uh, Zoom call um, uh, a few weeks ago? Which is absolutely incredible. And an, uh, and an uptake in membership of 10,000 over a very short period of time. So it's phenomenal, but we've got to see that over the longer term. And a lot of our workforce will be unemployed. Um, so it's, it's really quite superb. There's been this upsurge uh, and this recognition uh, that people must join trade unions. We must carry on with that, by the way. And I think we've got to fill, uh, put that into our narrative at every single opportunity that people should join trade unions. And we can't say that often enough. Uh, but it's incredible that it's been so effective in this time. Hopefully that will stimulate, not just turn to a trade union in this moment of, of crisis, but a deeper understanding of why people should be members of trade unions in, in peacetime, in the best of times, not just in times of crisis. Yeah, smashing. And there was an add-on question to that, which said that um, the Resolution Foundation recently re released a study showing that under 25s will be hardest hit. Carolyn, I'll, I'll try to address the issue of under 25s as, as, as best I can. But it, it struck me with my previous hat on in transport, the under 25s uh, were in a, 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 a really perilous position, uh, being often uh, poorly paid, the bottom of the rung in terms of, uh, of employment. So uh, equalisation of, uh, of rates of pay is critically important. They're being totally priced out of renting or buying anything that is, 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 is suitable. Uh, and of course, um, in, in my uh, 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 previous hat, I'm a Secretary State, Shadow Secretary of State for Transport. That is why when it came to the re-regulation of transport, I said, giving people another burden, another bill uh, uh, of, of high transport costs was inequitous. So it, what we should have done is, through re-regulation, ensure that they could have free public transport. That would have been a great uh, relief. So there are lots of individual things that we can do to improve the situation because the balance has completely shifted against that generation. And it, it's, it's hardly any surprise that there's such discontent, anxiety, and indeed mental health issues as a result because of the way, because of the hand that they've been, been dealt in recent times. So it's an urgent issue that we ignore at our peril. Um, so I wholeheartedly agree with the sentiments expressed by the, the questioner. Can, can I just add, add to that? In, in relation to the uh, prospect of... Um, three and a half million unemployed workers and consequently the uh, many of the workers Thanks. who are now joining trade unions possibly losing their jobs. I think the unions have got to think about uh, organizing unemployed workers uh, and harnessing their anger and frustration. And, and the same I think is true of the younger uh, workers I mean, the, it's the young people that have got the dynamism and the energy and the enthusiasm and the capacity to organise and so on. The unions have got to harness that and make sure that, they, that, they, uh, um, that the, the young workers who are joining the unions have a happy home in the unions and feel that they've got a, a role to uh, play so that it although many of the proposals that the Institute has made over labor law will no doubt be described by our enemies as a present for trade unions, actually they all involve the, the unions becoming um, more active perhaps than they've been and more dynamic and more um, innovative in, in the way that they uh, utilize the sad occasion which actually COVID-19 does does present now. Yeah, yeah. 
Yes, that is true. And with that kind of boost of what we can do in the future, I think I have to say our time is up. An hour goes so quickly. I hope you can hear me. I apologise to everybody for the problems with the sound that we've experienced. Maybe it's a bad time of night. Maybe there's too many on. I know Andy has to dash off to a vote in Parliament, which should take him for the rest of the evening. I can imagine. If you've liked what you've heard on this Zoom tonight, then do go onto our website, uh, browse through the publications that are there, sign up for our weekly newsletter, which is full of information, news and comments. Information on future events are all listed on our website. Um, so can I say thank you to our wonderful speakers this evening. Thank you to you all for joining us tonight. We hope to see you at uh, our future events. Thank you to James and Sarah for doing all the background information and we shall see you soon. Uh, this last slide here gives you information about how to subscribe and join our mailing list. So, bye.